This is your host, Leticia Wiggins, and welcome to History Talk, the history podcast for everyone produced by Origins. And I'm Patrick Patyandi, your other host. In part two of the show, Kevin Boyle, author of the National Book Award-winning Arc of Justice, will join us to discuss the importance and pitfalls of teaching the history of race and civil rights in the classroom. So stay tuned, and we hope you enjoy this episode of History Talk. We'll begin by asking uh, Kevin to introduce himself um, to join our first two guests, Stephanie Shaw and Hassan Jeffries. Sure. My name is Kevin Boyle, and I teach 20th century American history at Northwestern. Um, Hi, I'm Stephanie Shaw. I'm a professor of history here at Ohio State. Um, My research is primarily uh, related to African-American women, but I teach courses um, that sort of cover mostly the 19th century Afro-American and also uh, U.S. women's history. And I'm Hassan Kwame Jeffries, an associate professor of history here at The Ohio State University as well. Uh, And my areas of uh, research teaching uh, specialization uh, include the uh, civil rights movement, black power movement, uh, 20th century African American history more generally, but specifically civil rights uh, and black power eras. Great. So I'm getting right into the questions. Uh, Black and white Americans view race completely differently. This is proven by polls that are asking opinions about Trayvon Martin or Ferguson, Missouri, as the most recent examples of this. So given this stark difference, how can a teacher or a professor approach a classroom, which in all likelihood will hold a diverse array of views? One of the, for me anyways, one of the real key principles in going into a classroom is you can't control how students are going to receive information. You can try to provide the best arguments you have, the most sophisticated takes you can offer on any topic, race, class, um, politics, but you're not going to control how they receive that information. All you can do is try to engage with them um, in give them a space both to hear what you have to say and to express their opinions as honestly as they will. But there's just no controlling reception. Yeah, I w- no, I would agree. I mean, there's limits to what we would like to be able to control the environment once you come in and you close the doors. Um, but, you know, students bring their own cultural baggage with them, um, which is not a bad thing. I mean, that that's actually a good thing. I mean, what we want in the classroom is for students to bring that cultural baggage, but then to share it, right? I mean, to open it up and let the classroom become this constructive space um, or space for a constructive conversation. Um, and I think as uh, scholars of, the, um, of, of modern American history, um, that which happens outside of the classroom, I think, ought to be uh, brought into the classroom and discussed uh, in, and placed in historical context. I mean, if you just look at, as you mentioned, the example of what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, and just listening to some of the conversations uh, that went on and took place in the media, they could have benefited from the insights of a Kevin Boyle and Stephanie Shaw to sort of explain sort of this longer history of, um, you know, white supremacy, police violence, um, you know, and, and perceptions of sort of black males that was just sort of missing. So, but we get to do that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so hopefully our students will be a little bit, will benefit from that, you know, from that historical understanding. And so uh, I think we want to throw this next question directly to Stephanie to start us off. And so when a current event like a police involved shooting takes place either, you know, just before or during um, a class, um, is it the case that you see these as teachable moments to bring up directly in the classroom? Do you change your lesson plans maybe that you had previously planned already? How do you approach that sort of situation? Well, I guess, you know, I would want to be flexible all the time. You know, I would want to be prepared um, to, to have those kinds of discussions. But I, but I don't teach 20th century. I rarely do I teach 20th century. Um, and, and I think that that might be, um, that that might help to explain why things that happen now rarely come up in the classes that I teach. I mean, they do come up. Um, they do come up. And I do try to do exactly what people have already said, what Hassan and and, um, and Kevin have said, you know, to put them in some context. 
I do. I agree with Stephanie completely that you really want to be flexible in the classroom. You also want a discussion to be productive and to build on what the class has been doing. So I, and of course, I'm a control freak in the classroom, which probably adds to it. Um, so I'm slow to transform a class um, into in response to something that's immediately happening. I've done it, but I haven't done it very often. Um, but that's not to say that something like Ferguson um, isn't lying in the classroom already. And so what came to mind to me as you were asking the question is I taught a course in civil rights just this past spring, so before Ferguson. And the last day of class, I turned it over to the students, you know, created this long narrative of a movement, and I wanted to hear what they had to say about how it connects to their the present day. And the first thing that came up was the question of police stopping young black men and the assumptions that lie behind that. Um, so it's not as if those issues weren't already there and that the students wanted to engage with them. And it turned into a really fascinating discussion because, tying back to your previous point, this was a class with, which was overwhelmingly, though not exclusively white, um, had a block of a uh, number of African-American students and um, Asian-American students as well, but it was overwhelmingly white. And so the conversation became really very interesting to see as people from um, as students engaged with each other. Oh, and you know, I mean, the question of the the point of flexibility has been has has been raised by both Stephanie and Kevin. And I think that is key, right? I mean, you have to be flexible, and 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 how my flexibility manifests itself um, is that you know, if if uh, a subject or a topic or a current issue comes up, um, dependent upon the class, sometimes you know, I, I build that in. Uh, especially if I'm teaching sort of an African American mm-hmm. history class later on, you know, we may spend the first five minutes of you know sort of what's on your mind, um, you know, so that sort of you know planned, built in, early in, early on. Usually in some of my classes, I always try to make an attempt to get to class a little bit early, and so class will begin unofficially five minutes mm-hmm. before. Right, and so right. We have these really great conversations about those very things that mm-hmm. allow me to stay on track. Um, with the, you know, the curriculum and the syllabus, uh, but still sort of get in some of the issues so I can figure out, well, what's on the students' minds so that when we get to the subject for the day, uh, if there's a way to draw a connection or, or if I can bring, connect what they were talking about in this pre-class conversation to a topic that we've already discussed or going to discuss later, uh, it allows for a degree of flexibility and and seizing on these important moments, because if that's what the students are thinking about, I think it's helpful because uh, I can use that in, in some way to get them to see the importance of what it is that we're talking about in the class itself. Yeah, that's a that's a really great great point. Those for those five minutes before a class sometimes are the most valuable five minutes of the class. Mm keeping such a firm ground like almost in the past or like knowing the history of all of these things and still realizing that shootings like Ferguson occur with with some sort of regularity um, as a more personal question is this discouraging to to you as historians or as teachers of of the civil rights movement no, this is a sign you know I don't necessarily think it's discouraging maybe maybe I'm just a pessimist right I mean in, <laughs> in that you know I, I don't I haven't seen <laughs> I haven't seen enough in the past in the, in the immediate past for me to assume that this is going to stop anytime soon. Mm-hmm. And so when it occurs, I'm not like, "Oh my goodness, what has happened?" right? It's like, "Okay, this fits a pattern that I've seen, uh, perhaps maybe with, you know, somewhat decreasing frequency or the nature of the the context changes, but you can see the connections over time. I was thinking most recently um, about, and this is recent, about what happened in um, Atlanta with this uh, the basketball owner, Atlanta Hawks owner, and and him talking about you know white Southerners not wanting to uh, or being afraid of coming to these 
uh, Hawks games, these professional basketball games, because it's, you know, they don't want to be in these majority black audiences. And I said, well, you know, what's a, this is actually a sign of progress uh, in that 50 years ago, the solution, and, and he was fumbling for a solution, uh, maybe change the cheerleaders, right? Uh, well, 50 years ago, the solution was quite simple, and that was just ban black people. Right. I mean, that was, you know, sort of Jim Crow. Right? You just you don't let black people come. You just have an all white uh, uh, audience. Well, you know what? You, you can't do that now. Right. You just can't outright ban them. Right. I mean, that's been dealt with. So, you know, things, attitudes may not have fully changed, um, but uh, as a sign of progress in sort of a back ended way, you see there are limits to what people can do in terms of over and outright discrimination mm-hmm. against the group. I think, you know, for me, um, I don't think that I'm discouraged by it. Maybe I might be depressed by it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I might, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. I might sink a little bit deeper into, you know, whatever that is. Um, but, But in any case, when it happens, I don't think about it in history. You know, I don't think about... You know the fact that we haven't got that we haven't gotten any farther than we've gotten. I think about it as a member of a twentieth, twenty first century society. You know, and how bizarre it is that these kinds of things are still happening in a place that represents itself as, you know, a civilized. Nation, you know, so I think about it um, less as a historian and more as just a person who's here and seeing it and feeling it and and being, you know, outraged and and disgusted by it. Well, I really like Stephanie's point. I think it is a really depressing thing to see. I do think that it's important, as Hassan was saying, to see what happened in Ferguson, um, particularly in this long history of um, race in America. And the story can pull, the Ferguson incident can kind of pull in two directions. It can turn into the rogue cop story in which one bad apple causes this to happen. And that feeds back into a very long tradition of understanding race and race, racial tensions and racial dilemmas as personal, or it can turn into a discussion about large structures of race in America. Um, And one of the things that's actually been encouraging out of this horrible event um, has been the degree to which the structures of race have become points of discussion here and there, um, and particularly inside the legal system, which I guess feeds back to that question of teachable moments. It's a, mm. It says something really horrific about the state of American race relations historically and in the present day, that a young man has to be, the young man's murder becomes a teachable moment. And I think that really is, for me, what makes it one of the many things that makes this such a horrifying incident. But it is interesting to see how the discussion then unfolds in these kind of two tracks, which feed back to very, very different senses of America's racial history. Just to connect back what Kevin has said to the earlier Mm -hmm. conversation that Stephanie and I were having about the um, National Civil Rights Museum. I mean, one of the things that I think we worked hard to make clear uh, were this was a sense of the broader systems and structures at play um, in the establishment and perpetuation of racial discrimination and white supremacy in the United States. And so if you get to an, exi- an exhibit like uh, Birmingham, for example, uh, the problem wasn't solely uh, Sheriff Bull Connor, you know, mm-hmm. a rogue cop, a rogue sheriff in the, in, in, or, or police commissioner in this sense, uh, to lay blame and, and make it personal, because if that's the case, then you just get rid of the person and then everything should be fine. Uh, but instead, you see the broader systems and structures in place, the the big mules, the industrial chiefs who wanted to uh, maintain segregation and discrimination in a hard and fast color line. And so uh, keeping that in mind uh, it was something that I think was at the forefront uh, of what we were trying to do. And with so many important anniversaries of the civil rights movement um, happening in the last few years or in the next few years with the 1960s, 
What can students and the broader American public, as kind of one of our wrapping up questions here, learn from the civil rights movement today? And why is it important to learn about them? And if and if uh, Stephanie Hassan wanted to bring in um, their work with the Civil Rights Museum and as part of this answer, you should feel free to do that. So if Stephanie wanted to start us off. Well, one of the things that's important for me um, that students understand about the modern civil rights movement um, is how dangerous it can be to reduce it to a moment, you know, to reduce it to a particular moment in history and a specific, you know, and something as narrow as that. So so one of the things that, that I want and, and one of the things that I think that the museum did effectively was to show how during the Jim Crow era, a whole lot of groundwork got laid that made that helped to enhance, it didn't make the civil rights movement, but it enhanced the possibilities for the civil rights movement. The, the, the organizations that black folk created during the, during the Jim Crow era, the beneficial and benevolent societies, um, the, um, the various kinds of self-help groups, women's clubs, men, men's fraternal organizations, church groups, um, and, and also other organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League and the, and the Negro Business League and all of those things. You know, these, these institutions that were created during the Jim Crow era, um, you know, really were a part of the groundwork that, was, that needed to be there for the civil rights movement to become what it became. So for me, it's for people not to reduce these really important momentous movements to a moment in time, but to see the, the, the continuity, to see the process of their creation and their relationship to what came before. And I think that the museum does this really effectively, and it's one of the things that I try to do in classes, too. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I would, I would add, I mean, we actually tried to see that all the way throughout, mm-hmm. thinking about Mississippi, thinking about um, some just as an example, the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. I mean, you just don't get to a moment in '64, Freedom Summer, an anniversary coming up, and think that that just happened on its own. You have, you know, organizers and activists that go back um, several generations that help that help make that moment uh, of a movement possible. So I would absolutely agree with that, uh, and I would add that um, you know, sort of two two takeaways. Um, that I was that I was hoping uh, two takeaways. I think I hope people will take away. Uh, uh, one is that you know, sort of American history isn't perpetual progress. Um, that there are these moments uh, of opportunity, and, and many times these opportunities are lost. Um, and 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 so that's one. Um, so it's not sort of Disney history; everything just gets better. Um, that people are struggling um, to create change. Uh, but the second point is that change is possible um, as a result of uh, the hard work of ordinary. Uh, everyday people. Uh, and so if people uh, visiting the museum or people in, in, who, who take our classes, take my classes, come away with that, um, then that sense of either discouragement or depression, I hope, uh, can, 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 can be overcome somewhat, uh, or at least it doesn't become paralyzing or immobilizing. Because if you look back at this experience, um, that which has been achieved, the struggle that has been um, the struggle that resulted in it, it really did create change. Uh, and, and I think that is something that ought to be not only recognized but celebrated. And that, to me, is encouraging. I agree with everything that's been said. I'll just add maybe two points on. One is that one of the reasons why the, it's so important, as Stephanie was saying, to see the very deep roots and long tradition of struggle inside the African-American community, one of the things that also highlights on the other side of the color line is how deeply entrenched the institutions of white supremacy have been. That if you have kind of those those signal moments that become a shorthand for the movement, then the structures that the movement was breaking um, seem more fragile than they were. If you see the movement is long and having these long, deep roots, you realize how hard it was to break through some of those structures of white supremacy in the United States, how powerful they really were. The other side, uh, the other point that I thought I would add is for me, <clears throat> as a teaching the civil rights movement, I think what really is so important from my perspective to drive home to students is that more than any other 
aspect of 20th century American history. What the civil rights movement really drives home is the fundamental tension between America's promise and the reality of the United States, that this is a nation founded on, I mean, just explicitly founded on the principle that all people are created equal. Um, because what I think what Kevin said is so important, but, but what I also think is, you know, one of the values, if you will, of, you know, of, of teaching the earlier history of the U.S. in a certain way is also to make sure, you know, to help students to understand what that Enlightenment period, out of which those words, mm-hmm. all men are created mm-hmm. equal, mm-hmm. or from which all those words came, and what man meant at that time. And the struggle that, 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 we're con- that we're still having is people, it has to do with people accepting and understanding what that means. It's really important that people see that context that it really did not in, it did not mean to include black people. It did not mean to include women. Uh, it, it and it and probably even most white men were not included in that. So the struggle has been for everybody to be included in that, um, and it is obviously still the case that um, that some people still aren't. And the greatest challenge the United States has faced, in my mind, over its long history is living up to that promise and what the movement does is movement history does is it raises it puts front and center the struggle of ordinary people which again i think is a point that stephanie made so eloquently a little while ago deciding that that the gap between that promise and reality has to be bridged and that's what the movement history really drives home can really drive home to students as hope in the classroom that you have to take that promise seriously and that's what the movement did thank you all of you um thank you stephanie shaw hassan kwame jeffries and kevin boyle for joining us today for this discussion thanks for having us thank you so much thank you This edition of the Origins Podcast, History Talk, was brought to you by the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center in the History Department at The Ohio State University. Our main editors are Stephen Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Koheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Patrick Payandi and Leticia Wiggins. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcasts and more at our website, origins.osu.edu, on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And as always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. Thank you for listening.